So I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to welcome Richard Rosenfeld, who is the uh, Curator's Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Criminology and Criminal Justice at uh, the University of Missouri, St. Louis. He is, he's also a fellow and past president of ASC. Um, he foc his research focuses on crime trends and criminal justice policy. We've sent you one of his, his, his more recent reports, um, and he is here to talk about the, the crime trends in the pandemic. I appreciate the invitation. I'm actually going to talk this morning about uh, several of the points that are made in the uh, most recent report we've issued on crime rate changes during the pandemic, and, and I think you've received that report, uh, but I won't assume that you've read it yet. This may help. Okay, so I'm going to talk about weekly changes in crime rates across uh, a sample up to 34 cities in the United States. Uh, from January of 2018 through the third end of the third quarter this year and of September this year. <clears throat> um, the short takes are these, as should be uh, uh, not news for any of you. Uh, homicide rates rose sharply last year. Uh, in 29 of the 34 cities, they were up, uh, and the average increase was actually a little over 30%. And if <clears throat> you've taken a look at the uniform crime reports for the entire nation for 2020, uh, you may recall that homicide was up uh, in the UCR about 30%. So our sample, <clears throat> though it's a big city sample, is fairly representative. Um, I think uh, the major takeaway this morning is that the homicide increase, while it persists over last year, has slowed this year. Uh, and uh, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, we remain in the midst of a long-term drop in homicide and other serious crime since the early 90s. Uh, and uh, even with the recent increases in homicide rates in the United States, we're nowhere near <clears throat> the level uh, of uh, the early to mid-90s. Property crimes and drug offenses continue to fall. And I want to then uh, <clears throat> get into uh, explanations for what we've been seeing over the last uh, now, year and a half, um, and there is no single, definitive, conclusive consensus explanation about what's been going on, but I've tried to identify what I view as uh, the plausible cases for what we've been seeing. And then I want to talk about the policy challenges, even with a slowing rate of increase in homicide and other serious violence, uh, we continue to have a violence problem in our big cities. It needs to be addressed uh, effectively, and I'll talk about uh, some of the ways that might be done. All right, so I want to concentrate now on comparing the third quarter of this year, January through the end of September, with the third quarter in 2020. And in summary, what we see is that homicide rates were up 4% over the third quarter of January through the end of September uh, last year. Um, that rate of increase is quite a bit slower than the 30% increase we saw the year before. Aggravated assault, which are serious assaults uh, uh, committed with uh, a firearm, or that uh, produce or threaten serious bodily injury to the victim were up 3%. Gun assaults were up just 0.4% in the cities we looked at. Domestic violence was essentially unchanged, and I'll talk about uh, that finding in greater detail in a moment. And robbery rates <clears throat> were down 6% third quarter this year compared to uh, the end of the third quarter last year. So robbery looks a lot like the property crimes in its trend. <clears throat> uh, 
Residential burglaries were down 10% through the third quarter of this year compared to the same period last year. Non-residential burglaries, commercial burglaries, down 11%. Larcenies, which are thefts that are not accompanied by breaking and entering like a burglary or force, uh, <clears throat> down 5%. The interesting exception that I'll talk about is motor vehicle theft which continues to rise up 13% through the third quarter of this year compared to the same period last year. And drug offenses continue to fall down 14% through the third quarter of this year. So let's look at some of these trends. Um, oh, that's interesting. So <clears throat> I, I had the pandemic area shaded in pink uh, that shading didn't come through, but you can see the line that begins uh, 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 the pandemic period uh, in uh, middle of March um, 2020 uh, through September of this year. And so you see this rough cyclical pattern in weekly homicide rates up through the beginning of the pandemic. And then you see an increase uh, a decline, the, the uh, kind of seasonal cyclical changes continue to hold, but at a higher level, and then another increase uh, during uh, the spring and summer of this year, and some decline through the end of September. Overall, homicide rates, as I said, are up 4% through the third quarter of this year compared to the same period last year. So you see this big spike in homicide. Uh, that doesn't occur at the beginning of the pandemic. That occurs in the last week of May in 2020. George Floyd was killed in the last week of May, May 25th, 2020. That's when we see the big rise in most of our cities in homicide. Um, and um, for the remainder of the pandemic period, homicide rates remain uh, with fits and starts somewhat above their prior peak. But that one I want to call your attention to. Uh, there is a strong temporal correspondence between the rise in homicide, the initial rise in 2020, <clears throat> and the protest activity that emerged across the country uh, immediately after George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis. Uh, here are uh, 22 of those cities, just giving you a sense of which were up and by how much and which were down um, during uh, the third quarter of this year compared to the same period last year. And as you can see, some cities continue to go up, Austin up 80%, <clears throat> Louisville up uh, about a quarter, uh, LA up 16%, Nashville up 14 and so on, Washington up 8%. Uh, and then we see the, uh, not very much change, including no change in Chicago through the third quarter. Uh, and we see several cities with quite sizable declines. Seattle, where there were major protest activities, down 24% in the third quarter this year compared to last year. Phoenix down 11%, Milwaukee down 9%. So it's something of a mixed bag with an overall change just around 4% in homicide. That's a different story than the 2020 story compared to the year before, where homicides were up in nearly every large city and by uh, a little bit over 30%. Uh, here's the aggravated assault rate. It looks quite a bit like the homicide rate. You see this cyclical pattern, you know, that follows the seasons. You see the big rise, and that big rise, it turns out, corresponds with uh, uh, the emergence of protest activity after George Floyd was killed. You see the seasonal decline up again, and then a decline. Aggravated assaults up 3% compared to the uh, end of the third quarter last year. Gun assaults, pretty much the same story. You see this 
um, peak right here, this one week peak, that's Detroit. Anybody here from Detroit? Okay. Um, I left the Detroit data point in. I'm a little suspicious of it. It seems like uh, Detroit's increase, that's driving the increase in all 13 of these cities. Uh, it seemed to me it was just uh, exceptionally, unusually, abnormally high, uh, but, we, but I left it in. Uh, same thing for domestic violence. You see domestic violence also with a pronounced cyclical pattern, and we see no change overall in domestic violence during the pandemic. There's that Detroit effect again, though, and again, uh, I treat that with uh, some degree of suspicion. Robbery rates, as I mentioned, are down during the pandemic. Residential burglary rates, down during the pandemic. And those are declines, as you can see, that just continue the decline that had been occurring, in this case, in residential burglary for the past three years. Now, non-residential burglary is an interesting one. You see this enormous spike. That spike occurs in the last week of May 2020, and it's during that week that many cities, uh, the protest activity in many cities involved uh, breaking and entering, looting, and all of that would of course push up the non-residential or commercial burglary rate, but just as rapid, rapidly as it rose, it fell back to more normal levels just the week later. <clears throat> so the idea that across cities that experience protest activity. There was widespread and persistent looting, breaking and entering and so forth is a myth. Uh, there was that one week spike and in a couple of cities, breaking and entering and looting did persist. Portland, Oregon is a good example. But in the main, uh, that degree of mayhem, if you will, uh, lasted all but a week. I mentioned motor vehicle theft. You can see that it's up during the pandemic. Now, why would motor vehicle theft go up when all of the other property crimes are coming down? Uh, and uh, let me suggest two reasons. One is unemployment rates are up during that period. People are at home. Therefore, they're parking their car in their driveways, in some cases, or out on the street, as opposed to a secure parking lot at work. And that makes those vehicles more attractive targets for motor vehicle thieves. But there's another reason I think we should keep in mind when we're trying to understand uh, the persistence of the increase in motor vehicle theft. Motor vehicle theft has been called by some criminologists a keystone crime. That is to say, it's a crime committed to facilitate the commission of another crime. Think of your own cities. Think of homicides or shootings in your cities and the fraction of those that have uh, occurred uh, in motor vehicles, one motor vehicle to another a motor vehicle to people on the street. In a large fraction of those cases, those motor vehicles have been stolen. They were stolen for the purpose of committing a crime and then typically they're abandoned shortly thereafter or they're traded for something else of value. So I think there are two reasons why we might see this spike and in continuing increase in motor vehicle theft. Pandemic-related reason is that more people who are at home leaving their cars, in effect, unattended. But the other reason is this keystone effect we, uh, we tend to see for motor vehicle theft. We can talk more about that later if you like. Here are drug offenses. Drug offenses have been going down, down, down over time with a slightly greater rate of decrease during the pandemic but really, we're looking at a decrease that's several years old. Now, most drug offenses are 
coded by the police as offenses after a stop or an arrest is made and the individual suspect is found in the possession of illegal drugs. Not all are. In some cases, a drug offense results from a citizen calling up and saying there's drug-related activity going down on the street. But in the main, these are offenses that are coded as such after an arrest is made. So what we really have to ask about that is why are the police making fewer drug offense arrests, arrests uh, during this period? Well, I can give you the example of my own city of St. Louis uh, some years ago, uh, possession of relatively small amounts of marijuana uh, in the city was decriminalized. Uh, and that's the case in many other cities. And even in those cities that haven't decriminalized, there's clear evidence the police have been, uh, if you will, patrolling away from uh, drug offenses. Sometimes uh, a drug arrest will be made <clears throat> simply because the police are interested in someone for some other reason, such as involvement in a firearm-related crime. They don't find the gun. They can't make an arrest on the firearm-related crime they find drugs and they make that arrest. Um, but there's been a prioritizing away from at least uh, uh, enforcement of lower level drug offenses for many years now. And what we saw during the pandemic was just a slight acceleration of that trend. So where are, let's go back now to the heyday of the increases. Uh, and in those places where they've persisted. Where in our cities are they occurring? Uh, with respect to the communities in our cities where the increases are concentrated, those increases are concentrated in communities with chronically high levels of firearm violence, typically tied to racial disparity, segregation, elevated levels of poverty, and un underemployment or unemployment. That is to say, we tend to find the increases in those very parts of the city where historically violent crime, firearm violence have been concentrated. Who are the population groups most likely to uh, engage in these crimes? Uh, the increase is concentrated among young men who live in those communities. Now, it's young men, I didn't use the term teenager or adolescent, an important point here. There is this widespread assumption that the highest rates of involvement in serious firearm violence uh, occur among teenagers or adolescents. That's not true. They have elevated rates in recent years. But the highest rates continue to be found among young adults, young male adults in their 20s. Uh, and so this is a young adult problem more than it is a middle adolescence, early to middle or even late adolescence problem. I'm not trying to minimize the issue of youth involvement in firearm crime, uh, but uh, simply st statistically speaking, it's more prevalent among young adults. And there's very little evidence that the firearm violence spike that we saw is spreading to other areas or groups. Uh, and that runs in the face of some local reports. Uh, then President Trump, you may recall, began talking about crime moving into the suburbs and that sort of thing. We're just not seeing that. What we're seeing is that the increases were concentrated in the very communities the very population groups where high levels of serious violence have historically been concentrated. Now, on to explanations. The six that I'm going to provide are not exhaustive, nor are they mutually exclusive. They overlap in some ways. And so here they are, and I'll uh, focus on a few of them in just a moment. One is a change in the routine activities of the population during the pandemic. Uh, no big um, surprise there. Uh, 
people at home. Quarantine means that they're not out and about. The streets are emptied. Fewer uh, motor vehicles on the street, fewer pedestrians on the street. People are at home from work. This change in routine activities is related to a change in crime that I'll talk more about in a moment. Uh, one criminologist has referred to the pandemic as the greatest criminological experiment in history. I don't know if that's the case, but it certainly did fall in line with, in my business, what we refer to as the routine activity theory of crime. That is how crime patterns are tied to the day-to-day -day activities of the population. Depolicing, that is to say, uh, the withdrawal of police from vigorous enforcement. Uh, that uh, the police departments across the country, just as the rest of us were, were greatly affected by the pandemic. Lots of officers out on quarantine, and of those who remained on the job, subject to social distancing requirements or their own discretion to maintain distance between themselves and people on the street, that reduces the kind of face-to-face -face contact that can help to curb crime. During the height of uh, the protest activity last year, uh, lots of police officers were taken off their assignments out in the neighborhoods and redirected to patrol demonstrations typically occurring in the center of the city. Uh, and then there's the argument, and now we go back to the so-called Ferguson effect argument uh, made six years ago uh, when uh, back then we saw a spike in homicide. The idea that with all that protest activity and criticism of the police, um, the police simply uh, became even more demoralized than usual, right? Uh, and so they would drive by a corner they might have once stopped at because a bunch of young men are there and it looks like they might have been exchanging money for drugs. They'll just drive by. Uh, so there's that demoralization argument. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about it. I don't discount it fully. Uh, I don't think it's the major explanation for what we saw last year. Then there's the, this is kind of a clunky term, but the delegitimizing argument. The argument here is that in the aftermath of a major viral episode of police violence, especially one as egregious as uh, the killing in Minneapolis, uh, police legitimacy, especially in uh, disadvantaged communities of color in our cities, always somewhat fraught, plummets. And with a decline in confidence and trust in the police, one gets uh, fewer people willing to cooperate with the police in investigations, fewer people willing to call the police when they have knowledge of crime, more people taking matters into their own hands to settle disputes, sometimes with violence. The purchase of firearms, as I'm sure you know, went up during the pandemic. So we had more guns circulating in the population. There's also evidence from Chicago and a few other cities <clears throat> that the police were pulling more guns off the street during the pandemic than they had in the past, suggesting that there are more guns uh, uh, in the possession of individuals the police have contact with uh, during the pandemic than before. More guns, other things equal, means more shootings and uh, in some cases more homicides. More drugs. The drug markets heated up during the pandemic. Uh, drug overdose deaths, which is the best measure we have of the overall demand or consumption of illegal drugs, um, drug overdose deaths were trending down after uh, increasing rapidly for several years. We're trending down in 2018, 2019, but in 2020, they had a record of drug overdose deaths, experienced a record increase. 
and uh, with greater demand for illegal drugs, that means more people in the street drug markets and those social spaces can be somewhat risky. And um, uh, I've written now a couple of papers with colleagues showing a connection between the increase in drug overdose deaths and the increase in homicide rates uh, across counties in the United States, controlling for lots of other influences. And then finally, more stress, more strain, more frustration, more anger associated with the pandemic itself and the accompanying restrictions on, on all of us, right? So those are six explanations. They're not necessarily mutually exclusive. There could well be others that are not listed here. But I would argue these are probably the six major ones that make some degree of sense. What did I not put up here? Bail reform. Now, you've, I saw a slide up here about bail. Have you already seen a bail presentation? OK. Uh, I don't know what that presentation involved. But as you know, there have been arguments that with uh, COVID-related bail reform or bail reform brought about for other reasons, fewer people are in jail after having been arrested for a crime. And as a result, they're out, they remain on the streets and they contribute to crime increases. That argument is quite widespread. One hears it, continues to hear it from police departments in particular. Uh, and yet there's very, very little systematic evidence for it and quite a bit of evidence contrary to that idea. One excellent study was done here in Chicago by a group of researchers at Loyola University. Uh, and they looked at Cook County crime rates in relation to bail reform and they found no effect. So um, I don't think the, the story has ended about how bail reform might have contributed to an increase in crime. It's certainly uh, likely that if you look hard enough, you'll find someone on the street who might otherwise have been in jail prior to bail reform who committed a crime, right? The question is, in the aggregate, how much has bail reform contributed to those crime increases we saw? And bail reform persists even as the rate of increase in violent crime has gone down. So that's an explanation I didn't put up here. All right, let's talk a little bit more about some of these explanations. Uh, here's the change in routine activities. So what are we seeing here? This dashed line represents the uh, percentage increase in the number of hours, based on Google data, that people remained at home, right, over time, with the base being uh, basically zero in February. You see that uh, in mid-March to through April, we see that big rise, a 20% increase in time spent at home, and then we see the decline uh, through the summer months and oh, another slight rise afterwards. Not surprisingly, so that's a, that's a sizable and notable change in routine activities. Not surprisingly, uh, that change follows relatively closely the change in the unemployment rate over time. And more roughly follows the increase in uh, COVID-related deaths per 100,000 over time. We saw a big spike in December but not such a big spike in uh, residential duration or unemployment at the same time. So that's an illustration of how, of one way to gauge change in routine activities. Um, and in research that I published with uh, a colleague, uh, we found that change in routine activities did have an effect on, certainly on property crimes, and to a degree on violent crimes, that is, when you look at this early period, you see uh, smaller increases or even declines in many property crimes. If the shops are closed, there's no shoplifting, and that's a big chunk of the larceny rate. 
right? If people are more likely to be at home, uh, you'll get fewer home burglaries because burglars tend to avoid occupied households. Um, and so, uh, but it's also true that we, uh, we found that uh, smaller increases in violent crime in those places where there were larger changes in the amount of time people spent at home. Now, other things are affecting violent crime as well. So overall, violent crime continued to go up. But where residential duration was increasing, that increase in violent crime wasn't quite as great. How about this de-policing argument now? It makes a very strong assumption about the impact of policing on homicide rates and the impact of de-policing on the increase in homicide. I mentioned this example. One sees an example, this example or ones very much like it in the de-policing claims that are out there. So the idea is that police officers are demoralized um, or uh, for COVID-related reasons, they're reticent to engage in face-to-face -face contact with citizens. Um, one has to ask, what are the crimes that are most likely to be affected by that disengagement by the police? It's certainly not homicide first and foremost. It's those drug transactions on the corner that the police might once have stopped to investigate, but now just pass by. It's the petty assaults. Uh, it's the uh, drunken disorderlies. Uh, the public urinations, the disorder and relatively uh, less serious misdemeanor crimes, you would expect to increase first and most of all. It's, it's a strong assumption to say that the pullback by the police is going to have, what, generate a 30% increase in homicide across the big cities? Um, the police were not pulling back that much from investigating homicides. So I'm not suggesting the uh, de-policing argument in every instance is incorrect. I'm suggesting we have to be careful and think through exactly what types of crime it should be most likely to have affected. Probably not homicide in the first instance. Burglary and larceny rates dropped, uh, right? They dropped. You would expect de-policing to have some impact on burglary and larceny. If it were the only explanation for what was happening, burglary and larceny rates probably should have gone up, but they didn't. And yet motor vehicle theft rates went up. So you get this inconsistent pattern among, crime, uh, among crimes that policing should have about the same impact. And finally, the claim is largely anecdotal. Uh, although there is one study I'll highlight in a moment that's somewhat less anecdotal, but uh, it's based on anecdotes uh, that uh, you pick up from your interviews with police officers in your communities uh, or other police officials, or that we see in survey data, surveys like uh, there was a Pew survey asking the police, you know, nowadays, uh, are people in your department in effect drawing back uh, from full-scale, you know, engagement in their enforcement duties, and the answer was an overwhelming yes. There's no baseline on that survey. I uh, submit that whenever you ask the police, are people in the department demoralized, some non-zero fraction of the officers will say yes. Police these days tend to be a relatively demoralized bunch in many cases, somewhat cynical. So I'd be careful in how you interpret the survey data. Uh, and then you get studies like the one I've highlighted here. I won't go up there now, but you can if you like. And basically, it's a, it makes the claim that de-policing resulted in uh, the homicide rise and the rise in other serious violence by only looking at cities where arrest rates were going down and crime rates were going up, ignoring all the cities where arrest rates were going up uh, or where crime rates were not going up. Um, now, there is some systematic evidence on this issue, 
After Ferguson, six years ago, uh, there was a great deal of press attention, you may recall, devoted to the homicide spike we saw then. It wasn't nearly as large as the spike we saw last year, but it was quite sizable. And uh, there was this idea of a Ferguson effect. The police are pulling back because of anger, frustration, fear that their names would be spread all over social media and that sort of thing. So my colleague Joel Wallman and I looked at the 50 largest cities. We obtained arrest data for minor offenses in those cities and for more serious offenses. Again, assuming that if you're gonna see an increase in crime associated with a decline in arrests, you're gonna see it first and foremost among the less serious crimes. Well, we didn't see an increase in crime tied to the decline in arrests overall at all. We, we saw no relationship. And in fact, what we did see was that arrests had been going down. Uh, they did go down during 2015 and into 2016, you know, in the aftermath of Ferguson and comparable events around the country. But they'd been going down for several years before that, and the rate of decline wasn't any greater after Ferguson. So yes, arrests have been going down, but for reasons that don't appear to have much to do with um, the so-called depolicing argument that ties decline in police activity to demoralization. How about this legitimacy argument? The argument that confidence and trust plummets after major incidents of uh, police uh, violence, police misconduct. Um, there's a great deal of evidence suggesting that legitimacy um, uh, moves up and down over time. And uh, we don't have lo much local level evidence, but we do have, have national evidence, in this case from the Gallup poll, on the percentage of black and white adults with a great deal or quite a lot of confidence in the police, a decent measure of legitimacy nationwide. Uh, from the early 90s, through uh, 2020. And we'll, we, we don't see much change in confidence levels among whites. We see a big gap, not surprising, between white and black levels of confidence in the police. But what I want to call your attention to is what happens to confidence in the black population after uh, a major or several major viral incidents of police uh, violence. You see a 6% uh, percentage point drop in confidence among black adults, no change among whites uh, after Ferguson, um, and you see, um, what is that, a 12% or no, 11% drop in confidence uh, in Minneap after Minneapolis. So confidence in the police according to the nationwide polling data, certainly is affected by these incidents of uh, what many would regard as unwarranted or illegal police violence against citizens. Um, and the racial gap in uh, confidence in the police widened quite a, has widened quite a bit in recent years. Now that doesn't nail the argument that it's a decline in police legitimacy that's contributed to the increase in, in homicide. We need many, many local studies to really nail that one, and, and we've had some. Um, but that, I would argue, the legitimacy argument remains a leading contender as an explanation or part of the explanation for the rise in violence that we saw. Okay. Now, let me get on to recommendations. Um, these are my recommendations for what we might do. We've seen a, uh, a slowing of the increase in violence through the end of September this year. That doesn't mean we're out of the woods. Um, nor, you know, even had we not had that abrupt and major increase in homicide last year, in many of our cities, big and middle-sized cities and some smaller cities, homicide and other serious firearm violence remain 
uh, extremely important problems. So what's to be done? Um, we've, in my view, if we're going to make progress in continuing to reduce serious firearm violence in our cities, we have to engage in uh, responsible police reform. By responsible police reform, I'm not referring to abolishing the police department or defunding. I'm not an oppon opponent of defunding. It just seems to me the defunding argument puts the cart before the horse. We first have to figure out what we want our police departments to do. Then we have to decide what's the budgetary allotment needed uh, to support those activities. It could mean we give less money to the police and more money to other agencies. It could mean we would need to give more money to the police. But the accounting, the cost accounting, should come after, not before, we've decided what our police departments should be doing. I would argue that one reason the reform uh, measure in Minneapolis, anybody here from Minneapolis or St. Paul? I'd argue that one reason that that uh, measure went down pretty resoundingly in Minneapolis, and in particular uh, in the black population of Minneapolis, is that it was read as a defunding argument, and indeed it was, you know, to in effect uh, stop using the term police department to refer to those police officers who would now be part of a broader public safety approach to violence. But that was it. There was no plan. And if you read comments from people who voted against that measure, many of the comments were uh, go directly to that point. We didn't see a plan. We didn't know quite what we were voting on. We haven't gone through the process of deciding exactly what our police department should be doing uh, with some precision so that people know what a wholesale change over to a public health approach will mean in terms of what happens to policing in the city. Um, police reform, in my view, has to involve um, uh, an increase in accountability on the part of officers who've been shown to engage in proven misconduct. No question about that. And it should involve redirecting certain activities of the police to other agencies whose personnel are better able to handle them. An example I use, it's not one I, I hear others using so much, but it's one that comes to mind immediately for me, is why the police department is so often in the front lines of response to a drug overdose, which after all is a medical emergency. When the local fire department has been in the medical emergency services business for decades in all of our communities, most of the activities that your fire department engages in have little to nothing to do with putting out fires. They have to do with responding to medical emergencies. And firefighters are treated, excuse me, are trained in medical emergency response. Police officers, with, you know, with the exception of dab of training here and there, how to use Narcolan and that sort of thing, are not. So the fire department, should much more often be in the front lines of, of um, response to drug overdose than the police department, with a police officer perhaps being on background nearby if needed. In most cases, there's no evidence they are needed. This is a drug emerge, a medical emergency that doesn't involve violence or serious criminal misconduct other than the ingestion of an illegal drug of any other kind. Um, responding to the day-to-day -day problems of the homeless uh, and other troubled populations in our cities. Um, there are other agencies, social service agencies, whose personnel are much better trained than police officers. And the police are the first to tell you this. You know, when the police complain, hey, we're not social workers, indeed, they're not. Um, and so social workers, public health um, practitioners uh, who are trained in crisis intervention should be the frontline response to most of these instances. 
The police will argue, you never know, they will say, when responding to somebody who's acting out emotionally on the street, whether that individual could or will engage in violence that could harm people or, uh, around them. You never know. And that's true. You don't ever know. But what we do have is lots of evidence looking back at these cases that have occurred and asking the question, how often did that individual engage in violence? And the, and the answer is, not very often. So the police are right. You don't know in any given instance whether violence might occur. But you knew, do know in the aggregate, it rarely occurs. Uh, so what do we do with policing, given that evidence? Um, I would argue that the police probably should, in most instances, be alerted to remain on background. But the first response should, by and large, be by persons who are better trained in dealing with uh, those kinds of situations on the street. And that, you know, that's part and parcel, not only with what the reform movement has been demanding of police departments, but also what the general public would like to see uh, the police doing less of. Uh, and right here, there's a good um, uh, link to some survey data on public attitudes toward this issue of should the police be responding in all cases to uh, these kinds of uh, non-criminal events. Most calls for service, as you probably know, that come to the local police department did not involve criminal activity of any kind. And certainly the vast majority do not involve serious criminal activity. Um, in many cities, I don't know about yours, there is now a foot in the police department, a new strategy, really it's an older strategy, just kind of recombined and renamed, called the Group Violence Reduction Strategy. It's based on the principle of so-called focused deterrence, which in turn is based on the assumption that a relatively small fraction of the population accounts for a vastly disproportionate share of the violence in a community, both as perpetrators, but at the same time as victims. What the group violence reduction strategy then is all about is uh, delivering a message to that relatively small group. We obviously know who you are. We'll pull every lever we have at our, you know, we have available to us uh, to take you off the street if you continue to engage in violence. And here are our services and supports uh, that are available to you if you want to get out of this life and you want to uh, reduce the probability that you'll be the next victim. That program where it's been implemented has by and large been quite successful and departments around the country and cities around the country have begun adopting it. All right, um, I see Chris lingering here so I'm going to bring it to a close. I do think we should redouble so-called proactive policing. You know, cops on the dots, it's an old expression now, but it is, is as relevant now as it was. As long as the police response is proportionate to the problem, doesn't single out communities of color simply because they're communities of color, but goes to those relatively small spaces where serious violence and other serious crime tend to be concentrated, that strategy works and should be carried out in order to protect people in those communities where the violence increase has been concentrated. And with that, I'm finished and we've got plenty of time for questions and comments. Hi, Joseph with the Arizona Republic. This is just a clarifying question. Sure. Uh, on one of your slides, probably the, one of the earliest slides when it came to uh, homicide rises at the beginning of the pandemic, you mentioned this large spike in the very beginning of the yeah. pandemic, in the last weekend of May. Now, I'm curious about that because for those of us who cover crime, this is a spike that we see often at the end of May. It's like it's the Memorial Day spike. And so I'm curious if it isn't really a, maybe a bit before that, actually. Yeah, right there. 
right? That almost looks almost identical spike to what we see in 2019, probably around the same time period, right? That very right. large spike that this peak. So is it kind of still <coughs> fair to say this is something related to the protests, rather that this is something that we've seen, but everything is elevated? Well, I'm not sure about that. I would say that, yes, as uh, the weather warms in most of the places uh, you cover, uh, you do tend to see violent crime, uh, homicide specifically, go up. But that increase we see in the last week of May really wasn't preceded by a prior increase during the last week in May. If you go back through uh, the years prior to the pandemic, the previous spike occurred back here in September of 2018. Now, I don't know what accounted for that. But I don't see, if you go back, you know, and you look, I don't see a May spike. So I would argue, no, there was something distinctive about May 2020. You, you should expect the rates to be going up generally, however, as, as the weather warms and more people are out on the street. True. Um, yes, yeah, so Philip Jackson, I suppose. So, um, I actually had the same question, um, so I kind of wanted to piggyback a little bit. Uh, so there could be a possibility to, you know, like, and like when I was reporting in Baltimore at the time, uh, and that was kind of a heavy argument out there that um, homicides were increasing immediately after protests and stuff like that. But I guess, like, to add to his point, you know, like, outside stressors with the pandemic, economic issues, increased levels of poverty, lack of access, kind of what you um, mentioned, like an increase in uh, motor vehicle thefts, right? So like people kind of needing things to get to certain places, certain jobs, also more kids on the street because schools were closed at the time. Mm -hmm. um, all those things probably played a factor. Would you agree with that or? I do agree. Um, so, um, I don't, I have to tell you quite honestly, I'm not sure altogether what to make of this correspondence between the spike, the initial spike in homicide we saw in the end of May 2020, uh, and you know, the, at the very same time, the emergence uh, and widespread presence of protest activity around the country. Uh, the explanation that speaks most directly to that argument is that, well, there are perhaps two, the delegitimizing argument, the argument that people were just frankly uh, pissed off. And for a variety of reasons, uh, you know, the no snitching norms came back into play, uh, and for whatever reason, people simply decided the police were not to be trusted low levels of confidence in the police, further alienation of the communities from the police, less cooperation with the police, all contributing to an increase. Um, that's one argument. I do not discount the importance of, and that's why I mentioned it at the end, the stress, the strain, economic and emotional strain associated with the pandemic itself. But keep in mind, the big rise we see in homicide doesn't begin during the first months of the pandemic, right? Remember that change in routine activities sort of peaks in March and through April. The big rise we see is in the last week of May. That's when it, in effect, the homicide rise kicks off. So I don't wanna suggest that there's a hard and fast connection, causal connection between the protest activity uh, and the homicide rise. I'm simply intrigued by the correspondence in time between the two. Sure. Uh, I wanted to ask if the homicide and aggravated assault rates uh, include those done by police. They do not. Okay. So I think there was also. Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yes, um, though one can count the number of quote unquote progressive DAs on one hand in the big city. Chicago is one of them, St. Louis city and county uh, uh, also have what I think uh, would be considered progressive DAs, Philadelphia, a few other places. Yeah. I also wanted to note that uh, there was also an increase in protests for anti-mask rallies, anti-vaccine rallies, and uh, uh, white supremacist rallies yeah. that also caused violence. So would you say that it was an overall, uh, hmm. not just a racial justice uprising, but other violence? Uh, That's fascinating. And, you know, I have to tell you that when I think back to the summer of 2020, um, I'm thinking primarily of the Black Lives Matter related protests. But you're right, those weren't the only protests. And in fact, those protests generated counter protests by right wingers of all kinds. Uh, and so one then asks, a criminologist would then ask, what happens to day to day violence rates amidst the perception that the city has come unglued? Right? And the answer is uh, uh, a widespread answer among criminologists. You should expect day to day crime rates, violence specifically, to go up as people perceive a breakdown in social order. So, great point. And now you've got me to go back and look at just see how prevalent the, those right wing protests were during the summer of 2020. Hi, um, I'm Akasi. I'm with the Associated Press in Austin. Um, sorry. Um, my, <laughs> my question is regarding uh, the cities that continue to see a spike in violence. Uh -huh. I know Austin was one of the cities right. that has seen a, a large spike, right. um, especially considering that a lot of the factors that you were talking about contributing to this were during the pandemic. Um, and when it comes to the quarterly uh, comparison, it seems like cities like Austin are still seeing an extremely high rise. So what additional factors would you say um, could be contributing to that, especially considering that um, a lot of politicians in the area have blamed things like deep policing. Right. Um, when you see cities like Austin continuing to experience sort of high double digit increases in homicide, whereas most cities increases are not nearly as large or actually they're declining, that should then send you to local circumstances. And so in the case of Austin, I'm not certain. I know there's been a great deal of discussion, controversy in Austin about uh, the police department budget and what the city, what people in the city want out of the police department. I don't know quite how that's shaken out. Maybe some of you have a better sense of kind of the criminal justice politics in Austin than I do. Um, but the general point is when you see, you know, the, it's, Austin's kind of off trend uh, compared to, say, Chicago or St. St. Louis. Is, uh, we've seen a fairly sizable decline in homicide uh, in 21 compared to 20. Uh, so what we're getting is, you know, in 20, we saw nearly all cities marching lockstep up. Into 21, we're getting a more fragmented picture. And the more fragmented the picture is, the more you're drawn to local circumstances. I wish I could tell you exactly what those might be in Austin. I simply don't know. Yeah, I'm Leah Skeen with The Advocate in Baton Rouge. Um, I just wanted to go back to what you mentioned about domestic violence. Yeah, oh, good point. Saying that it didn't increase nationally. Right. Um, are those only instances that are being reported to police, and is there concern that other cases were going unreported during Yes. Yeah, and in fact, I wanted to 
I said I would talk more about domestic violence and I forgot, so thanks for the question. Yeah, we sh in, we've done, this is our seventh report on crime rate changes since the beginning of the pandemic. And in none of those reports have we seen a big increase in domestic violence. You're right, these are data that we obtain directly from local police departments. So in order for a domestic violence incident to show up in our data, somebody had to report it to the police. Typically that's a victim, sometimes a neighbor. If victims are sequestered with their abusers, right, they're probably much less likely able to um, report an instance of domestic violence to the police. And so my own view is, and there's some other research suggesting is, overall domestic violence was probably up. How much? Hard to know. Um, but uh, what we're seeing in the police data is no sizable change, and I think that is because we've got a reduction in reports to uh, the police. Mr. Rosenfeld, good to see you. Sure. Um, you mentioned that um, stemming the recent increase in gun violence yeah. depends partly on reforming police. Yes. Responsible police reform. Yeah. Um, I guess to what extent do you feel like the uh, reform-minded prosecutor's offices play, uh, what role do they play in reforming the police departments? Or how do they hold police accountable um, for their actions? And w what role do the police unions play ah. in that? Do they... Yeah primarily resist those reforms across the board? Uh, well, on the police union front, yes, with exceptions, I'm simply not aware of, but I'm sure there might be one or two. Police unions have been really much, pretty much at the front of resistance to the kinds of reforms that um, I've mentioned. It, now, I think there's real bargaining space, however, especially with respect to the police response to incidents with respect to which the police say, themselves say they're not really well trained to handle, right? Uh, drug overdoses, um, acting out on the street on, that doesn't involve serious criminal activity. So I think there's bargaining space there their sentiment on the part of rank and file officers to uh, give up some of those activities, but in return for what, right? Then you've got to ask, what are the officers going to get in return? In cities like St. Louis, it has to be higher pay. It has to be higher pay. Um, but I think there's negotiating space there. With respect to the prosecutor's office, I don't know, let's take our own city as an example. That may be not the best example. Um, this is me speaking, not Joel Courier. We, uh, we have a progressive prosecutor in the city of St. Louis who has been criticized for, ru uh, for running an office incompetently. That's me speaking. Uh, and, um, that, uh, that prosecutor has taken actions, not against the police department, but actions in an attempt, I think a reform-related attempt. For example, our prosecutor has compiled a list of police officers who, from the prosecutor's point of view, have engaged in activities, uh, if not strictly speaking, misconduct, activities the prosecutor certainly disagrees with, and therefore um, is uh, anyone on that list who comes to the prosecutor's office trying to get a warrant uh, issued on a particular crime, uh, they can't, can't do it, right? Now, I don't know that that's persisted. That was her pretty early on in, in her tenure. Uh, that's one way prosecutors can attempt to reform the police. But frankly, I don't see the reform effort coming primarily out of the prosecutor's office. I really don't. There's an ages old tension between the police and prosecutors, not just progressive prosecutors. With the police almost universally saying, look, we make a good case, we send it to you, you're elected, and therefore you're gonna cherry pick only those cases you're certain you could win, and that's leaving a lot of people out on the street who should be 
uh, sh should have been tried and convicted, right? That goes on everywhere. Uh, and so you're then asking the prosecutor's office or uh, asking the pro to lay on that ages old tension, this additional effort to get the police to behave differently. I think it's, I'm frankly, uh, I, I'm more optimistic about the reform efforts coming from advocacy groups in the community uh, or in some cases coming out of the, uh, the city council or mayor's office than I am for the prosecutor's office. Um, you know, I, anybody here from Philadelphia? Okay. Has Larry Krasner been able to affect reforms in the Philadelphia, reforms in the Philadelphia police, uh, police department as far as you know? Yeah. Right. Are you a Philadelphia reporter as well? Yeah. Okay. Right. I'm guessing in Philadelphia, like St. Louis and many other places, the real engine of reform is coming out of community groups. All right, so just piggybacking off of the spike that came a few weeks into the pandemic, has there been talk about criminologists about <clears throat> the rhetoric that's been coming out of the police unions and police commissioners, I mean, specifically in New York City? I think I remember at this point, especially when protests started, oh, well, the criminals have the streets, there's no, there's no penalties, there's no this. And, and I only think of this because a police source of mine in New Jersey called me and he, during this, and said, I, I don't understand what the motivation is there because it would seem like to this person, not even putting words in their mouth, that this would then embolden criminals by saying that these laws embolden criminals, by saying that there's no penalties, there's no recourse for going out and having yeah. a gun and shooting people. And it seems like that rhetoric, I mean, specifically because bail reform was being enacted at that time, it seemed to have a, a correlation, obviously, in the pandemic yeah. as well, but... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's a great question. How much does, you know, that's the stuff that... Uh, we see in the, uh, in the local press, and we sometimes hear on local TV. Um, does that get translated down to the street in a way that's going to affect people's behavior on the street? Uh, people who are engaged uh, in a serious and continuous way in crime on the street do engage with police officers all the time. But they're not engaging with the commissioner. They're engaging with officers they they see on the block and so on. So I'm wondering, I, I don't think that rhetoric does anyone any good. I think it's false for one thing. Um, but the degree to which the rhetoric itself has contributed to the spike in violence, I'm just not so sure about.